On October 1, 1993, Polly Hanna Class, a resident of 4th Street in Petaluma, California, along with two female friends, were participating in a time-honored tradition amongst preteens, the sleepover. What should have been a safe night turned to chaos when a man broke into the house wielding a knife while Polly's mother slept. Unbeknownst to Polly and her friends as they tried on Halloween costumes, a man was standing outside her bedroom door, listening. Between 10.30 and 11 p.m., when Polly opened the door to get more supplies for the party, all three girls saw a tall, dark figure standing in the doorway, knife and duffel bag in hand. As the man walked into the room, the girls fixated on the long knife with a wooden handle, which he threatened them with, and asked, Who lives here? To which Polly replied, I do. The intruder's knife kept the girls quiet as he used strips of fabric and Nintendo cords to bind their wrists and ankles. After binding all three terrified girls by the hands and feet and putting pillowcases over their heads, he told the two guests to count to a thousand as he took Polly, who was sobbing, and forced her into his car. The girls waited until they heard the closing of the front door, and then they frantically began trying to untie themselves by standing back to back and fumbling at each other's bindings. But when that didn't work, one girl was able to bring her hands underneath her legs and step through the ties around her arms, bringing her hands to the front and enabling her to untie herself and then the other girl. Once free, the two ran to Polly's sleeping mother, Eve Nichols, who was promptly awakened by screams of, Polly's gone. Polly's mother promptly called police at 11.03. During questioning, the lead officer in charge had to briefly consider that the two girls were making this whole story up as some type of elaborate teenage prank. But the girls' vehemence and raw panic convinced him otherwise. The FBI was quickly called to help investigate, and the Petaluma Police Department sent out an alert to all surrounding departments. Upon canvassing, a neighbor told police that around 10.30 that night, a man had nonchalantly walked up the driveway and casually opened the front door to Polly's home. By the mannerisms of the man, who seemed so relaxed and at home, the neighbor assumed he was someone who was either staying at the house or who knew the family and did not raise any sort of alarm. Little did the neighbor know that he had witnessed Polly's abductor right before her kidnapping. Because of the casual manner in which the neighbor recalled the man walking into the house, police briefly considered whether or not it had been Polly's father who had taken her. Polly's parents were divorced, and because most child abductions involve someone close to the child, police briefly considered the father, Mark Class, who lived in neighboring Sausalito, as a suspect, but after more investigation and the administration of a polygraph test, he was cleared of any suspicion and the investigation focused on a stranger abduction, which statistically did not bode well for Polly, as 75% of stranger abductions end in murder. Upon careful and tedious crime scene analysis, police found a palm print on the bunk bed frame in Polly's room. The palm print is not a match to any family members or visitors to the home. Unlike fingerprints, there was no database for palm prints, so the function of the print would only serve to match to an existing suspect. While police were analyzing the crime scene for any details, investigators were diligently interviewing the two young witnesses to Polly's kidnapping. They utilized a sketch artist to draw what the girls remembered about the man. The girls recalled he was white, had a yellow bandana around his head, and had facial hair. Thanks to the avant-garde techniques of two concerned and computer-literate Petaluma residents, Gary French and Bill Rhodes, along with journalist Larry Magid, Polly's case was the first missing persons case to utilize the internet as a means of spreading awareness. Although the World Wide Web was very much in its infancy, Polly's missing poster was shared with those savvy enough to be online in 1993 and was downloaded not only in numerous states throughout the U.S., but also in countries across the world, making Polly's case the first missing child's case to go viral. In all, Polly's image was shared digitally more than two billion times. 
Besides the internet, more classic methods of raising awareness and cultivating resources was utilized, such as the posting of flyers around town, the passing out of pre-recorded tapes playing information about Polly, the faxing of flyers to local stores and supermarkets for distribution, and the passing out of t-shirts with Polly's image on it, and even the stuffing of flyers into the bottoms of boxes of BioBottoms kids' clothes, of which Polly's mother was a sales manager. Over 8 million pieces of paper printed with Polly's image and information were dispersed across the world in places as far flung as Kathmandu. The general hope of the almost 4,000 volunteers participating in the search was that high visibility would mean that Polly and her abductor could not travel freely. But as it turned out, the culprit and his innocent victim had been in Petaluma's backyard the entire time. Over 4,000 volunteers assisted in the search for Polly, covering over 1,000 miles of fields, meadows, apple orchards, and redwood preserves. Additionally, air support was brought in, and helicopters and airplanes searched 3,000 square miles of land for any signs of a girl who is now on the forefront of everyone's mind. The Petaluma community came together and created the Poly Class Search Center, a one-stop shop that would enable the volunteers to organize and methodically spread the word. This unified system of volunteers, the media, the community members, and the families of victims working in tandem helped to form a model of how missing children searches should be enacted in the future, instead of in the disjointed manner in which they were currently conducted in 1993. The Poly Class Search Center eventually would field calls from other parents of missing children and would assist in the ensuing search and media blitz needed to find a missing child. Winona Ryder, a well-known film actress who was originally from Petaluma, offered a $200,000 reward for any information that successfully helped bring Class home. Then, one day, there is seemingly a break in the case. Mark Class's brother-in-law was watching the home of Polly's father when a call came in. The voice on the other end of the line was purporting to be Polly and claimed she was being held in a hotel room. The voice claimed that someone was keeping her there and that they had stepped out but would be back soon. Then the line disconnected. Frantic, Polly's uncle called police, who quickly mobilized to put a tap on the phone. Soon, another call came in, similar to the first. It was traced to Hayward, a city close by in the East Bay. But, when police arrived at the Chase location, they found it to be not a hotel, but a middle-class home with a teenage girl living in it. She claimed to have been dared to make these prank phone calls, and family members were devastated to learn it had all been a sick hoax. Three weeks after the abduction, on October 19th, police got a call from a man claiming to have Polly and asking for ransom money. Because police phones are automatically tapped, authorities were able to get the offender's location almost instantly, but found it was just another hoax, this one born not of a teenage prank, but very adult greed and stupidity. The man had hoped to extort money from the police without much forethought into the process, and he was swiftly arrested. Soon after, Vallejo police contacted Petaluma police with a potential suspect. He was caught breaking into the home of a single mother of a 12-year-old girl and had with him a knife and what they called a rape kit. He became a central suspect due to the similarities in circumstances, but no evidence was able to link him to the crime. In the course of the investigation, Petaluma police received a tip that Polly might be held at a cabin deep in the woods in Northern California. The Petaluma PD went to a cabin in Mendocino County on a tip from a confidential FBI informant who claimed Polly was being held captive by drug dealers in some sort of revenge kidnapping. But as SWAT teams descended upon the cabin in the dead of night, the head of the Petaluma Police Department task force received a call from the FBI agent in charge of handling the confidential informant and was told that the entire thing had been made up. The mission was aborted and the police were back to square one. Then, on November 28th, finally, after so many false leads and false hope, Dana Jaffe, a woman who had previously called police about a suspicious man on her property the night of Polly's kidnapping, and who lived on Pythian Road in Santa Rosa, about 25 miles north of Petaluma, called police for the second time in two months. This time, she was walking around her property after loggers had cleared some trees of hers when she came upon a collection of items which raised her suspicions. 
They looked like bindings that had been used to tie someone up. Police dispatch sent out Detective Larry Pelton, who had been present in the bedroom crime scene of the kidnapping, and he was called to investigate the Jaffe property. He discovered strips of white cloth, which he instantly recognized as matching the cloth that the two girls were tied up with. This discovery prompted police to look further into Dana's prior call, which had come the same night as the kidnapping, almost two months before. Two months prior, about one hour after Polly was abducted, a resident of Oakmont Village in Santa Rosa, a town about 25 miles away from Petaluma, had just come home from work and relieved her nanny of her duties. Dana Jaffe's nanny was leaving for the night when she saw a strange man standing on the private road that leads to the Jaffe house on the inside of the fenced-off property. Terrified, she quickly drove to a nearby gas station and called Dana to tell her that a terrifying-looking man was on the inside of the perimeter of her property and to get out as fast as she could. Dana threw both of her kids into the car and promptly drove off the property to call police and safety. When the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department responded to Dana's call, they found a man named Richard Allen Davis standing next to his rusty Ford Pinto, which had run off into a ditch. Davis was sweaty, short of breath, and had leaves and twigs in his hair. Deputies were unable to see that Davis matched the description of the kidnapper as described on the teletype about one hour prior because they never even heard the broadcast as it was not shared with their individual radios by the Sheriff's Department. Davis claimed he was merely sightseeing and had gotten lost and distracted and run into the ditch. The officers bought the story after running his name, and seeing no outstanding warrants and briefly searching the car, they let him go. Even though they had found an open bottle of beer, they did not arrest him for driving under the influence as they had technically not caught him driving. He was standing next to his car. The officers were not even aware that a neighboring county was on the search for a 12-year-old kidnapping victim because they were on a different radio system. In 1993, there was no such thing as an Amber Alert, so the officers had no way of knowing of the emerging case. Based on the evidence, it is supposed that by the time Davis was being questioned by police next to his car, Polly was already dead and Richard was coming back to collect her body, but had broken down prior to reaching his goal. Because of the lack of cross-county communication, the officers had no reason to check the priors, or they would have realized that they were talking to a suspicious man who had been convicted of kidnapping twice before. Davis was let go after the property owner decided not to press charges. His car was towed. Police made the man swear to never go on Dana Jaffe's property again, and then released him next to the highway. Two months later, this late-night call would become contextualized upon the finding of torn fabric used to bind the girls and the discovery of torn ballet tights which matched items from Polly's room. With this new information in hand, police revisited the call made the night of October 2nd and found the name and driver's license photo of the man they had stopped that night. The resemblance of Richard Allen Davis's features to that of the sketch provided by Polly's friends was noticeable almost instantly. Richard Allen Davis, who had been convicted of kidnapping twice before, had actually been in the presence and in the hands of police two times in the past two months, once when they stopped him on Jaffe's property the night of Polly's abduction, and a second time a few weeks later, on October 19th. On October 19th, Davis was pulled over in Ukiah and arrested for driving under the influence. He was booked into the county jail where they had police sketches of the suspected kidnapper on the actual walls of the jail but no one noticed the resemblance or questioned Davis's past crimes. In 1976, Davis had kidnapped a woman and sexually assaulted her. He claimed he was hearing voices and had heard the disembodied voice of a dead girlfriend postulating on what it was like to be raped. He served five years for this crime. Then, in 1984, he abducted another woman and stole $6,000 from her. He served eight years for this second felony and was paroled in June of 1993, just four months before Polly was abducted. Upon realizing the connection, police began intense surveillance of Davis. After surveilling him for two days and finding no new evidence, they decided to move in and arrest him. 
Police went to the home of Davis' sister in Ukiah, where, after questioning the sister and searching the home for Polly, they set up a perimeter and ended up catching Richard as he tried to get back onto the property. A low-key and calm arrest was made, but Richard insisted he knew nothing about Polly. However, after obtaining a copy of his handprints, the crime lab was able to say that the palm print left at the scene of the crime was in fact a match to that of Richard Davis, and police breathed a sigh of relief as they finally are given a break in the case. However, their relief was short-lived, because even though the palm print left conclusively proved Richard's presence, the police couldn't feel any joy until they found Polly. Initially, Richard insisted that the police had no proof that he had ever been in Polly's house and denied any knowledge of the crime. But when presented with a copy of the palm print analysis, he quickly changed his story and confessed. It is in his confession that police learned their greatest fears had been confirmed. Polly had been killed. Four days after his arrest, and after an exhaustive search of the scene on Pythian Road and the surrounding property, which spanned for four days, Richard finally confessed to strangling Polly the night of October 1st, and eventually led police to Polly's makeshift burial location off of Highway 101 near Cloverdale. Detectives noted that Davis casually smoked a cigarette as he told investigators to go towards the right of a fallen tree. There they would uncover the unrecognizable remains of 12-year-old Polly Class, thus ending the search in the most tragic way possible. It turns out that in the early hours of October 2nd, when officers received a call of a strange man trespassing on a private road, Polly was probably already dead. Although Davis would not give an exact timeline of events, based on his limited conversations with police and in conjunction with the evidence collected, detectives believe that Polly was attacked and killed near Dana Jaffe's property prior to deputies stopping Davis and towing his car. Prosecutors surmise that Davis hid Polly's body in some bushes and then was stopped by police before he could move her to her final resting place, a grave location police believe he had already picked out. Upon hearing the news that Polly had been found deceased, Polly's father, Mark, sat by the fire and simply sobbed. The search was over, the truth was out, hope was gone. Eve Nichols, Polly's mother, had kept a candle lit in the window of Polly's home in hopes she would come back, but after hearing the tragic news from officers, she went and gut-wrenchingly blew the candle out. Prosecutors claim that this was a premeditated crime. They claim Richard had stalked Polly for weeks prior to the abduction. The state also alleges that in addition to the kidnapping, Davis attempted a lewd act on Polly. Prosecutors allege that after the lewd act was performed, that Davis killed Polly. On June 18, 1996, Davis was convicted of kidnapping, lewd acts, and first-degree murder. Upon hearing his death sentence, Davis turned to the jury and eerily winked, blew a kiss, and then flipped them off with both hands. In the sentencing proceedings, the presiding judge, after sentencing Davis to die of lethal injection, said, quote, It is very easy for me to pronounce this sentence, given your revolting behavior in this courtroom. Davis is currently an inmate of San Quentin State Prison in Marin, just 25 miles from Polly's family home. He continues to enact appeals and is locked in solitary confinement after an intentional drug overdose, as well as numerous attacks by other inmates. Winona Ryder, who was an active advocate for Polly's family during the search, dedicated her role as Joe in the feature film Little Women to Polly's life and memory. Because of the tragedy of the lack of communication on the night of Polly's kidnapping, the California Highway Patrol changed the manner in which it broadcasts alerts. Whereas before counties had separate systems, now such alerts as kidnapping are broadcast statewide on a centralized system. Polly's case also led to the enacting of the Three Strikes Law, which mandates life in prison for lifetime criminals like Davis, convicted of three separate felonies. In honor of her beautiful life and memory, Polly's Mark established the Class Kids Foundation, which is dedicated to finding missing children and helping those affected by crimes against children. <laughs> 